is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing, moms? I think it's Mother's Day. I think this show is being released on Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day, mothers. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Dr. Andrew J. Debrin is an industrial organizational psychologist. He deals with behavior in the workplace. He's been a college professor and author for years, but he went with Paige when he decided to publish his book, Tolerating Ambiguity for Leadership and Professional Effectiveness. And I thought it would be interesting to find out why he went with Paige. Oh, I took a shot at it. I just, it's very difficult to get a publisher these days for a trade book. Very, very difficult. And so I took a chance with Page. It seemed legitimate. I mean, offices in Staten Island, they do a lot of advertising. So rather than go through the, uh, keep trying and trying with all these publishers, Uh, They usually want you to have a platform, meaning that you're giving dozens of seminars and national television shows so you could sell a lot of books through your personal contacts. Right. I found the title extremely interesting, Tolerating Ambiguity for Leadership and Professional Effectiveness, which is kind of ambiguous in itself, is it not? Yes, it is. It is a little bit uh, ambiguous, but... It's such a key part of being successful in so many fields to be able to tolerate ambiguity. When I dug into the research, I found that even physical scientists and medical scientists admitted that a lot of the work they do is ambiguous. For example, what disease does a person really have? You have these symptoms. Could it be uh, this? Could it be that uh, disorder? So in order to be effective, you have to be able to tolerate a little ambiguity. And do you think people have a low tolerance for ambiguity? Many people do have a low tolerance for ambiguity. Successful people can tolerate ambiguity. I remember speaking to a retired man who had a very successful career. I mentioned this book to him. He said, you're right. What else is there? If if any time you're making a big decision, it's going to be about something ambiguous. So... If you don't tolerate ambiguity, then it's, it's I, basically it's going to paralyze you. It's going to be hard to move forward. That's right. You won't, uh, you won't get anywhere. Can't make big decisions. Even just take the simplest things like, should we have a year-end party this year? And the team, the department, they argue about it. Should we call it a Christmas party? And someone say, oh, no, no, that's passe. We can't use that term, Christmas. And other people say, well, this is the Christmas time. Let's have a Christmas party. And other people say, hey, we'll have this great roast beef banquet. And other people say, no, 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 no. We've got vegans on the team. There's so much contradictory information sometimes, even on decisions that seems like they would be relatively simple. So you have to be able to tolerate ambiguity to finally come up with a plan for the party rather than shrugging your shoulders and saying, there's nothing I can do about it. I don't have enough concrete information. It's okay not to tolerate ambiguity, but I, I definitely think that you have to learn to tolerate some ambiguity in order to move ahead in your career to be a leader or to be a successful uh, professional person. I looked into uh, other textbooks I've written and try to see what little theme do I see there. And, so, and a few plays that showed up in order to be creative, you have to tolerate ambiguity. In order to be a leader, you have to tolerate ambiguity. And I said, you know, this is something really important, but there's so little about it. And I only found a couple of books on the whole topic, one management book, and then there was a, um, a child's book on tolerating ambiguity, <laughs> a cute cartoon book, a beautiful little book on teaching little children to tolerate ambiguity. It was the only two books I could find. You're looking at Amazon, looking any place. Huh. So I said, this here's something that's very important, but underreported. All right. Well, there's nothing ambiguous about that, is there? Thank you. Joseph Flynn met a lot of characters in the construction industry, but nothing compared to when he bought a tavern. There was no shortage of interesting stories and people. They are the backbone of his book about a fictional character looking back on his life as he deals with liver disease. The name of his book, Last Call for Alcohol. Well, he's uh, medicated, and he goes back into his childhood and on to teen years and stories from then on through. Being a iron worker and then uh, a tavern owner, his name is Patrick. He goes into this tavern 
in Calumet City, Illinois. And he meets this girl that was standing by her, and her name was Pat. And her mother's name was Patty. And he falls in love with her, and they get married, and then he ends up a tavern owner. And a lot of the stories after that are, are tavern-type stories. There's a couple of stories. The Tornadoes uh, uh, was going to Milwaukee uh, for a wedding and missed a tornado right behind us within five minutes that killed 40 people in Oaklawn, uh, Illinois, which is probably five miles from the city of Chicago, five to ten. Wow. And there was another tornado actually in the city of Chicago where I worked at a printing company that hit the building. That's in there. I live within three to four blocks of the nurses that were murdered, the eight nurses, and that story's in there. You know, there's some horrible stories and some funny. It just goes on from one little story on to the other. As a tavern owner, people, they don't give you tips as a bartender, but they want to buy you drinks. So you try and, you know, avoid that. Sometimes it's not easy, but uh, that's just the way the business is. You're, you're actually like a, a psychoanalyst because all you hear is people's problems and good times, bad times. They just need somebody to talk to. Yes, they do. And actually, you get the same people coming in day after day. Yeah. Uh, I had a guy that came in every day, and he used to eat peanuts. And finally, I asked him, well, why do you eat all these peanuts? He says, because my wife can smell beer on me. And if I eat the peanuts, I don't smell like beer. I said, that's kind of funny. I said, did she ever notice? He said, well, once she said, why do you eat so much peanut butter? You know, that type of thing. And this character, I came there after work one day to check on the bar and the ambulance was there and everything. And this walked in and the peanut guy was laying on the floor, all blue. He had a heart attack. They hauled him out. So I was going to go see him the next day at the hospital, but I had to stop at the tavern and bring some change for the bartender. And I walked in and the guy was sitting in the same bar stool uh, who just had a heart attack. I said, what are you doing here? He says, that's with that hospital. I walked out. By the time I got back here, got in my car and got home, my wife didn't even miss me. Oh, so the real story is about a month later, he died of a massive heart attack. It, it goes on and one guy after another, one person or one lady or whatever type of a thing. But the bar- book is short. I really, I've had people read it in three hours, three and a half hours. Right. But everybody that's read it really likes it. So I don't know. I mean, it just, ha- it depends on your, if you're from the, 50s and 60s, yes, you'll you'll love it. Like I have grandkids that have read it, and they they were really interested. So because it's a time they don't know, and it's interesting to them. It's just like when Mad Men was on television. All of the millennials loved Mad Men. They loved the clothes. You know, it was set in the 50s, and that was yes. an unknown era to them. So yeah, so that's interesting my, to them. My story's in a way a lot, a sort of like the Christmas story, where it goes from one thing on through the other. Right. Where, where he's a little bit little kid and gets beat up and all kind of stuff through that that right. type of thing. So are you doing a book signing in the tavern? I've sold a lot of books in the union. Uh-huh. Uh, a lot of these guys have bought the book, uh, iron workers and you know, uh, pipe insulators that I, I worked for, have bought that book and just love it. If you, always, if you always wanted to be a bartender, you'll like it. All right. Is there a moral to the story? Yeah, don't drink. Uh-huh. I got it. Thanks, Joseph. Clark O'Reilly lives in a town of 900 in Nebraska. She trains horses and judges horse shows, and it was through that experience that she came up with an idea for her first book entitled Take Care of My Memories. Um, a lot of it came through my horse activities. I've had at least six concussions over the years, all with worse um cases of amnesia, um, nothing remotely like in the book. Um, and I just began to wonder if something happened to me, would my family be able to tell me some of the things um, that maybe I didn't want to hear? You know, we all have those things in our background that we don't necessarily want to remember, whether it's um, some form of abuse or even just breaking up with a significant other. Would my family want to tell me about that? So I figured I would just write about it and and see what the characters in the book would do. Okay, so you let your characters kind of go to work then. Exactly, yes. We meet Adelaide in the middle of a nightmare of all places, and she's got some secret that she's not telling anybody, but we know she's left her family behind. Um, And then she unfortunately gets into a horse accident and gets amnesia, doesn't remember anything. And then she ends up having to go back home to the family that she left behind that she hasn't spoken to in years. And at that point, we go kind of to their point of view 
how how they're handling what the secret that they know they're keeping from her, how they should tell her if they should tell her. So we find out at the end whether they tell her or they keep it from her. Yes. Would I like to say I'd love to make a million dollars and and make my living off of this book? Heck yes, I would. But I'd much rather get the message out there. Even if I don't sell a lot of books, um, I'd rather get the the message of the book out to, to the groups that need it, the ones that need that sort of support, that sort of their voice heard sort of thing. I mean, it's not the, the type of abuse is not something we talk about in society a lot. It's kind of taboo. And I, that's one thing I wanted to do is just hit it head on, um, raw, unfiltered, and just say the things that, that people want said. So I would love for it to get to those types of groups and, and advocacy programs and things like that and really make a difference that way. Was it abuse? Was it mental, physical? Uh, it was abuse. Yeah, there's some abuse there within the family and, and covering it up um, from some of the other family members. So there's a little bit of that mental mental abuse in there as well. Um, but I think it's a, a prevalent theme because I mean again we've all had that thing in our family that you know the the older brother got caught you know smoking marijuana and but we don't tell anybody and we never talk about you know that sort of thing granted this is on a much more extreme level it's definitely something that I think has not been written about a whole lot I mean it's a thing that happens it's in the media all the time now so I think it's a prevalent thing and, and people need to know that there's others out there that that aren't afraid to talk about it to make sure that people know what's happening. Um, I've always wanted to write a book and I told myself on my birthday that I was done with the excuses. I was done putting it off. I was just going to go ahead and do it, even though I had all the other stuff uh, going on at the same time. And so it took me about nine months to go from starting to published And it was a very busy nine months, but I, uh, yeah, this was the time to do it. I was not going to put it off anymore. Um, Social media has been a great resource through Facebook, things like that. I've gone to a couple of conventions to trade books. I've done a couple of book clubs. Um, The hospital I worked at had a nurse's book club, so I got them to read it and they absolutely loved it. So that was nice. I'm doing my best to promote it as much as I can. Um, I would love to be able to do a book signing at at any type of bookstore. I actually live in Nebraska in a very small town of 900 people in Nebraska in the middle of nowhere. So getting to a a major bookstore, really any bookstore, um, is quite the, the challenge just to even just to drive there is a couple of hours to the closest bookstore that so I guess yeah. social media is like your best bet isn't it it yes it is and all my friends and family have been very supportive sharing things on Facebook and um, buying the books themselves I'm pretty sure 90 percent of my sales have been my immediate friends and family wow. <laughs> so bless their hearts that's what families are for, right, Clark? And uh, I guess, yeah, social media, really the only way to go when you're in the middle of nowhere. All right, we have to take a very short break, but we're coming right back. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them and they'll even give you their feedback and if they like what they read page publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at amazon the apple itunes store and other outlets they'll handle everything copyright protection printing cover art publicity and editing so if you've written a novel a children's book a cookbook inspirational work a book of poetry or biography and want to get it published then you need to call page publishing and do it immediately call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. 
We're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. When Cynthia Smith isn't creating, she's taking care of her autistic son and her elderly mom. I say creating for a reason. She was visiting with family when a conversation hit a nerve for Cynthia and inspired her book, Don't Judge a Book by Its Cover. You know, it was kind of weird. I was down in Portland visit- visiting my father-in-law with my family um, because he is getting older now and he's in his 90s and, you know, we just take every opportunity we can get. And I was talking to my sister-in-law about just how people judge everybody and, you know, all that and, and how they need to just look beyond what they see because if they get to know the person, they might get a way different picture, you know, just because somebody may look a certain way, they may maybe the kindest, most gentle person you've ever met in your life. You know, somebody might look a little rough around the edges and you're, oh, they're doing drugs and blah, 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 blah. Well, guess what? Maybe they're not. You know, you just can't decide based on what you see, you know. Um, And people go through it in the justice system, you know. They don't get a good defense. They get falsely jailed for something they may not have done. You know, just because they might look rough. Did you have any personal experience with that? To a degree. It wasn't my family, though. I just thought, you know, people need to take a deeper look inside themselves and uh, see what they're doing to cause the problem. And maybe they can, you know, if enough people get to it, maybe, maybe some of these things can change. Right. It's not a story. It's a picture book. No words at all. There's a description of the book, but there's no words to the story it's based on the cover of the book has a picture of a rough looking gentleman in a leather jacket and jeans and mountains behind him going into some cabin or something and you're like hmm and then you open up the book and start looking at the pictures it's nothing what you thought it would be and so it's just by perspective you know and people looking inside themselves what that means to them because I wanted more thought to be created. I didn't want them to just hear my opinion. It would be for, you know, teenagers, adults, or even just people that love photography for the pictures that are on the inside. I love taking pictures, and I thought that might be kind of a cool way to draw the story, you know? Do you do book signings or anything like that for this book? We've got a center here in town that has agreed to to let me do that when I'm ready to set it up. Yeah, we're a little bit secluded. Where are you? I am in Oak Harbor, Washington. It is on an island um, called Whidbey Island. So um, our biggest store is Walmart, and it's not even a super Walmart. Hmm. It takes about mm, maybe an hour to a town that does have malls and bookstores and all that kind of stuff. Do you have a bridge or do you have to take a ferry? Well, we take a bridge to get to the town I was talking about. But if you want to go more south in Washington, like towards Everett, Seattle, or Olympia, then you need to take the ferry off the island. Oh, my gosh. You know, we just interviewed someone right before the break. Also had the same problem in the middle of nowhere. Good thing we have social media, huh? Thank you. I'm going to say a series of no good, very bad events led Paloma Campana to write her book entitled Nearly 50, a collection of essays, events that included a recent career shift from two decades as a litigation attorney to antique shop owner and full-time writer. And she lives to tell the story. This is a big intentional shift to finally get to do what I have wanted to do, which is write at the top of the day. Good for you. Nearly 50 is about a series of events that happened in the two weeks leading up to my 50th birthday. And it was challenges that ranged everywhere from a friend committing suicide to my encountering a wolf in the wild by myself in upstate New York to being bitten in the face by our rescue dog, Red. Jeez. It was a tough two weeks, right? I think without the pen and paper, it would have been probably impossible to process that many major stressors in a short period of time. 
and actually come through with an ending that I could live with and feel good about and carry on. So spoiler alert, you do need to read the book to see what all went on. But, you know, it's just life, right? Sometimes it really is just that messy. If we're lucky, we get little breaks in between, but sometimes you just don't. And so part of what I was hoping to accomplish was to send out this message in a bottle and say to other people out there, you know, it it does get tough sometimes, but you can get through this too. How did you get through it? Wrote the book, literally. I'm not kidding. I am a real-time writer by genre. And so what that means is my coping technique for stress is to write. So I'll grab a piece of paper, I'll grab a pen, and wherever I am, I just sort of time out everybody as best as I can and start writing to figure out how to move forward. It is the weirdest thing when somebody dies that's close to you or close to a friend and wondering why the world just doesn't stop. It doesn't. It doesn't stop for your hurt. The world is going on without you. And so you have a choice. You have a choice. Right. Right. And if we can tune into what that feels like, imagine how much more compassionate it makes us when we're walking through our day. And boy, a little bit of kindness goes a very long way. We could definitely, definitely use more of that. Are you getting out and talking about all this? I am. Uh, Most recently, I was at Park Road Books, a great independent bookstore in Charlotte, North Carolina. And we did both a writing workshop and also uh, read and sign. And the writing workshop happened to be right after Valentine's Day. So we talked about the secondary theme from nearly 50, which is love and when to hang on and when to let go. You have a new direction, don't you? Well, the passion has always been here. I've been a writer since I started my first journal at age nine is when I I like to think of the, the departure point. But it is great to be able to do it as a public part of my day. So not to be, you know, the big bad attorney in the courtroom, going home on the weekends and doing open mics, you know, upon occasion or writing workshops or retreats, but to really be starting my day and saying, which piece am I going to work on today? What workshop am I sitting with, with poetry that I just wrote this week? Right. What what contest am I actually going to manage to make the submission on deadline? Oh, man. Purpose. Imagine that. Intent. <laughs> yeah. Imagine that. I will imagine that. Thank you. Finally, Margie Green Moss was a nurse for many years, and she has a message for young women in her book, Mizzy, You Are Never Alone. How you doing, Margie? Right now, I am completely retired. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I'm a published author. You got that right. (laughs) (laughs) The book is about a young lady who was born in the South, and before she knew anything about herself, she was relocated to the big city of New York, where she was lost. She didn't have her family. Only person she had around her was her mother, who was very pretty much absorbed with uh, worldly things. And so she didn't get that much attention, but she grew up not knowing she was blessed, like most of us don't know. And she was watched and nurtured by the spirit. And um, after she grew up and made lots of mistakes, she recognized who she was or who she is. It's based on a true story, but it's not all true from my knowledge, from my experiences. She saw visions, visions that were just standing there and and out of place. But she went on not addressing them, really, just seeing them and going on. And they didn't bother her and she didn't bother them kind of thing. That's how New Yorkers are. They'll pass right by anything that's not touching them, you know? What was the vision? She saw visions of priests men that were dressed like priests, let me say. And nobody else saw them. She saw them, and they didn't say anything to her. She didn't say anything. She just went on. She just saw them from time to time. After she'd seen several visions over her lifetime, she was beginning to lose a husband to another woman. She began to drink and smoke by herself. 
she got into a situation in a um, movie theater that was very demeaning and very uh, destructive to her. That was her fall. And she had heard from her uncle over the years, you need to go to church. She tried to be a church member, but she didn't have any leadership. And so when she fell, she was so uh, broken that she opened her heart to Christ. And she went to church and she asked for salvation and she changed her life. The message is that we have the opportunity all the time, but we don't recognize it. We are watched. We can feel that we are watched. Sometimes we're uncomfortable about how somebody is looking at us out of the corner of our eye, but we just go on and just, just don't make a big deal of anything until a particular time when it, something really hits home to you, and then you wake up and say, wow. That's what's been happening all the time. You want to inspire people with this book. I do. And also, I want to, I want young ladies, because Mizzy was so misplaced, I think, in her surroundings. She just walked through like on a cloud or something. And I think young ladies uh, need to be more aware of um, their feelings. You know, if they like somebody, you know, Kind of try to think about why. Why do I like that person? You know, I know that's kind of mature for a young girl, but if we can instill in something in them to think more, I think they'll be more able to protect themselves from some of the things they fall into. You got that right, Margie. Thank you. And that's a wrap for this edition of the Page Publishing Book Club. Thanks so much for joining us or downloading us at 710WOR.com. That's where you find the podcasts. Hope you're inspired and now thinking, hmm, time for me to finally sit down and write my first book. If the authors you've just heard from can do it, you know you can do it too. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. <laughs>